one. Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Kagiyama, and I'd like to welcome everyone here to To Be Your Own Hero. I'm a stage four prostate, bone, and lung cancer patient. Been dealing with cancer since 2021. Doing absolutely fabulous, and I'm so happy to be here. And please subscribe, like, make a comment in the comment section of the video, and ring the notification bell for further videos. Uh, I've pretty much, uh, you know, we're so happy that we moved to from California to Texas, and we have our granddaughter, and we're getting acclimated to a new area, and and we really love it. We're really happy here. And I am also really, really happy to have a very, very special guest, Julia Fox Garrison. And let me tell you something, I've had a chance to speak with her on, on, on several occasions now. And Julia is special, absolutely special. And this is part two of a two part video. And the first video, which aired last week, was called um, Cancer, uh, Stroke, Cancer, Plus More. And Julia Fox Garrison is her own hero. She is truly special. So I'd like to introduce you once again to Julia. Julia, please tell hey, us everybody. about yourself. <laughs> and let's get this thing rocking. Hello, um, Mark calling, Mark just said I was special and my, my husband says that too, but he always has the addendum special needs. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> like, but we're all special needs, right? <laughs> we have our own little idiosyncrasies. Um, I don't know, do I, so I'm Julia Fox Garrison. I I suffered a stroke 26 years ago and wrote a book, uh, a four-year window of the recovery of that of that um, of my rehabilitation. And I never had. So we'll talk a little bit about the book. It's called "Don't Leave Me This Way" or "When I Get Back on My Feet, You'll Be Sorry." And um, it's it's. It was selected by Reader's Digest as today's best nonfiction. It's been selected by Nursing Spectrum for top seven must reads for anyone pursuing a nursing career. It's won an award for humor in medicine. It's been on the bestseller list twice in the Boston area. Um, it, it's done. It's done. It's taken on its own life and it turned my life into it changed the trajectory of my life, which in my previous life before stroke, I was a support manager for a company that did software. And my role was to uh, handle all the software support problems that customers were having. And I had to apply that knowledge to my body after stroke. So when I was recovering from stroke, I was in the hospital for three years. Uh, three years, well, <laughs> three months. And I came home, I left to go to work and I was on my way to work. I turned the radio off. I had an hour commute and I said, to, I said, thank you God for my house, my home, my job, all the really big things. And then uh, I, once the, um, I had the hemorrhage, uh, I was at work I had, instead of, this is what I tell everyone, if you have something wrong that seems alarming to you, do not hesitate to call an ambulance. I did not call an ambulance because I didn't want to alarm my the people I was working with. And I had my our administrative assistant take me to the hospital and I literally was giving her directions on how to get there and while she's dropped, I'd say, take a left, I'm dying. Take a right, I'm dying. And I I actually um, walked in on my own power, but because I didn't take an ambulance, they, um, I, they took the ambulance before me with only cuts and bruises, whereas I was actually truly dying. I 
uh, I every time my blood pressure pulsed, it was releasing blood in my brain. And that had gone on from two o'clock to about four or five, where I, I ultimately passed out. Um, so anyway, the reason I wrote this book was not because I had a fire in my belly or or that I wanted to be an author. I, I actually o o always said that I wanted someone to write a book and dedicate it to me so I'd have my name in print, but not have to do the work. So I wrote it, though, because I received so much negativity during my rehabilitation because I was told I was going to die. My brain was blistered in every vessel and um it, it it was I was in a very precarious state and plus I was completely paralyzed on my left side so what I what was happening was I was being told that you know there wasn't really much hope I, I if I lived if I lived if I wouldn't get out of a wheelchair and I was like watch me so the book was written <laughs> about um in a form this is why it caused such a stir amongst all the publishers in New York because um, what happened was I self-published and in two months it caused, I, I sold more books than Harry Potter at Christmas, which was like astounding. So wow. yeah, that's why in New York, all the publishers uh, were very interested in my story. And so it was so popular, it went to a publisher auction, which is really like every author wants that. Wow. And so you really have control and it was great. So, um, and I had a wonderful agent and the, I ended up pick, uh, you know, I went to New York and I met with the publishers and I, I, I went with Harper Collins because they really, uh, they really respected my story and they didn't want to make broad stroke changes. That was really important to me. So the book is the reason why it caused such a stir though, was because the first, it's, this is a unique format. The first few chapters are written in third person. And the reason it's done that way is so that the reader sees me do my life by routine. They're seeing me actually, um, you're a voyeur into my life. But that's what we do as humans. We fall into routine. So uh, um, the, the first two chapters are in that. And that's when I'm thanking God for the house of home. And then once the hemorrhage occurs, I end the chapter where she's gone because she truly was gone. And what I learned after the fact was all whoa, the right. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What? <laughs> Explain that because because you lost me. <laughs> oh, okay. So what I learned was I was trying to be that person of July 16th of okay. 97. And I could never be that person again. Okay. Whether, okay. Or, but that's a really good question. Um, whether I was whole or not, I, I but I this is where I've learned. I've learned so much through this adversity that um, I'm not the same person that I was when I woke up this morning just by the, the interactions I've had today. So um, I was striving to be her and she was gone. And I start up the, chap the next chapter with second person. So now you're on the journey of the gurney with me. You feel the frustration, the confusion, the anger, the, all those things that are uh, encompass in in struggling to overcome and then the last two chapters are in first person because it wasn't my place to preach to the reader I wanted to show the things I learned and what I'm doing at the end of the book is thanking thanking God for being able to roll over in bed by myself to be able to get up and brush my teeth myself to actually dress myself I had lost all those abilities. I had no autonomy recovering. And uh, let me pause things. you right there. Yeah. And <laughs> what was your what was your mindset to propel you to uh, get better? Because uh, I remember when I was going through that, when I was at my weakest, what was going through my mind was. Every day I woke up, oh, number one, I was thankful to wake up. But number two, I wanted to do everything I could to get better that day. What was your mindset uh, as far as getting better? So with, with, with uh, brain injury, it's, it's measured in minutia. Um, and so 
it was very difficult to see any improvement but i was i was obsessed i wanted to i didn't say why i said how can i get back to being rory's mom and i i i want to be married to jim and not have him be my nurse and i i believe i must have had an internal not anger at anyone or anger at anything but an internal anger to because I literally didn't know my body anymore. I, I was disassociated completely from it. And it, it was like, I, I had to almost mourn the left side of my body because it really is. And I, I, ne I don't like using the, the word never, but it, it's, it's, it's been 26 years. And I mean, if I wanted to just bring my hand back, like I was, this hand is good for decorating, <laughs> but it, it doesn't do much, but um, it can do, you know, minimal things. And even that I'm grateful for. But if I spent the time working on just my hand recovery, I could get more back. But at some point during this long, slow recovery, I had to decide where was the quality of my life. I, I had to put a stake in the ground of saying, Okay, what happened was my husband would come home from, I couldn't be alone 24 seven. That was the other thing because I couldn't do anything. And my husband would come home from work and say, you know, what happened with the stroke today? What? And I said, one day, I think it was a year after I was home, I said, the stroke's taking a back seat. It doesn't own us and it's no longer going to have the power over us. And so, yes, it will raise its ugly head, but we are not going to let it control us. And that's the same with the cancer uh, journey I've been on. We're, it's, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot that when you get told you have cancer, it, it never goes away. It will, and, and, and it's like, how do you deal? And I've been communicating with another friend who has stage four pancreatic and keeping her, you know, talking about being buoyant and, and positive and inner strength and, you know, how how can we take our power back? And so it's, this, it's the same thing. It's just, I think for me, I had so much internal anger about no one giving me hope. No one. I, 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 it, was, it was like I had to create my own hope. I had to des decide what... What was my future? Um, everybody had, the prognosis was so bleak that it was like, you know, this is it. This is going to be my life. And I'm like, no, it's not. I have a three-year-old. My son literally was three on Saturday and we had a construction theme party. And I incorporate this into my talks um, about, it was such a, um, the juxtaposition of this innocent three-year-old construction theme party. And then five days later, I'm reconstructing my life, reconstructing my body. And he had more ability than I did at, at three-year-old than I, I could, I couldn't walk. I, I had to relearn how to, I joke, I had to relearn how to eat, you know, and I did a good job. I had to relearn, you know, steps and, and everything. It was like being an infant. And, and then having parts that didn't work. So um, the book was written for two reasons. One, I wanted to show the healthcare professionals that there's a human being inside every patient that they treat and we're all unique and we all will react differently and our rehabilitation will be different. We all are climbing a mountain, but we're taking different paths. So there was that. And then the other side, was I wanted to show those that are being told negative, like your terminal, your this, all these things that are said by men or men and women professionals, and they mean well, but they're just basing it on science and recovery. And what Mark and I have been talking about, recovery and rehabilitation is way more than just the statistics, because I was told I, you know, it was 2% for the stroke and for the, for my, um, for my cancer, which I call Cindy, <laughs> because I think it's just more lively and buoyant and gives me control over it, that um, I had less than 2% of surviving this, that uh, stomach 
the stomach Cindy does not, um, it's not a, a good path. And I said, well, watch me. If you're going to tell me no, get out of my way. <laughs> because I'm, I'm, I'm going, I said, you don't even know me. You don't even know what I'm capable of. And, and that's the thing. Um, yeah, I let me pause, let me pause you right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. <laughs> You're bringing up such a great point. Um, unless you put your foot down with your doctor, they're going to just put you in a box along with everybody else. Yep. And, and you're a number. But as a patient, we need to advocate for ourselves and rise above being a number in you know, say, hey, I'm a person. Exactly. And, and that's what, what you're saying. It, yes. it, and that's so important uh, right. to stand up for yourself because otherwise they're just going to push you around. They're going to get you in line and, uh, you know, expect you to follow whatever they did with the last hundred well, people. So, so in my book, I have Dr. Jerk and I have Nurse Doom, Dr. Bleak, Dr. Panic. And the, I've, I've, I've been a keynote at many medical conferences and I've had the question, why is he Dr. Jerk? And I said, where do I begin? But he had diagnosed me with a diagnosis that was incorrect. And the treatment was um, a, a, a cytoxin chemotherapy, which is, is not even administered these days because it's, so, it, it's like nine hours of intravenous uh, fluid to protect your organs and then a half hour of the, the actual uh, cytoxin. So um, I think I talked about that the last episode about how you trusting your intuition and, and don't be bullied. If you don't have a good connection with your doctor, and I can't say this enough, then have the, I, it, and it takes enormous uh, strength to do this but find someone who meshes with your personality too. Someone who's smart, but someone who meshes with your personality because I, I, I've I had doctors where they 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 don't, I'm, I love laughing and I love joking and I, I'm, I'm all about pranks. I mean, the pranks I pulled in the hospital were, were, they were fun and they were not dangerous or anything like that. They would just make, make the nurses and the CNAs laugh and, uh, I mean, at one point, like here's a, here's a quick story. Um, when the surgeons do brain surgery, they shave only half your head and the other half. And I had long hair at the time uh, as long. And it, I had been laying in the bed and it was like a rat's nest, just all. And so um, I asked someone to come in and, and shave the rest of my hair. And he went, he went to throw it out. And I said, no, throw it under the bed. And then later that night, when you know I I press the call button and the nurse or a, a CNA would come in, I'd say, I think there's a rodent under my bed. I can hear it scratching, <laughs> and it was like my it looked like a rodent under the bed. Oh my god, we laughed, and and those are kind of things that were like fun and and yes, you have to advocate for yourself because you know doctors go into the profession because they mean well. The people who pursue healthcare, they pursue it because they have a passion and a calling. But at the same time, it, they, it you know they have to do so much because they also have to connect with not only the science but they have to connect with the personalities they're dealing with. So you have to give them some leeway. So you need to find one one that just meshes with your personality. And I had to do that with with my oncologist. And it was super hard because I had been there for already, you know, 14 months and had built a little bit of a culture there, um, knowing everybody. And I, I even bought uh, at the cancer center, I used to bring, uh, I was there every two weeks and then I'd go home with a pump and I, I'd i bring butterflies, 3D butterflies, and I'd put them on whatever pod room I was in. And so over time, there was butterflies wherever I, even in the bathroom, I had butterflies. So it was like, just a, like spreading joy, you know, and in a, in a place that like um, may have lacked it. 
Um, but for the most part, I find that the professionals in the cancer centers are the most kindest. Um, when my dad was fine, fighting um, lymphoma, uh, because I knew the ropes from the cytoxin days, I said, dad, you want to get there early so you can be near a window or, you know, you want the best location if you're going to be there for the day. So I went with him and I'd hang. And I remember saying to the nurse who was administering to him, I'd say, is this, this must be hard what you see every day. And you know what she said? And I love this. She said, no, I find it invigorating because these people in here are fighting and surviving and doing everything they can. And I love that approach. And that's what I have found in, in the cancer. Most cancer professionals are just super, um, they, they, they have hope for you. They, they, they are excited when you have a victory. Uh, if you have a clean scan, I've had five clean scans. I was told I, I'm not even in the 2%. I'm like in a 1% thing. I, it's amazing. Um, I'm, I'm asking for prayers on July, uh, January 11th is my next PET scan. And it will be a year from, from that, uh, of no treatment. So, um, it's possible for everyone out there. You can all do it. You can do it and you can do your own path. Mark has a different path than I have. And my path is different from you and, and, um, just find what works for you, but just most important is your self-talk and know that the self-talk is what's your self-talk is like, we are not kind to ourselves when we talk to ourselves. And we tolerate things that we say to ourselves that we would never tolerate from someone else. And that's the point. Your self-talk should be empowering and realize that you're the only one listening. So you're the one that also knows if you're being authentic. So remember that the words you're using in your head is your first form of communication. And I was gonna say, um, you know how many times we say can't a day? I, I've been changing some of the words and the semantics of words. So I don't say, I say can't, but I always follow with yet because then you have the door of possibility. So remember that if you have to say can't, remember to add those that door of possibility by saying yet. Like I can't rollerblade yet, but I plan on someday maybe or horseback riding or things like that. So you know, don't give up your dreams because you have these obstacles. Because one of the things I've learned is all the obstacles and challenges I have faced have made me incredibly wise, way beyond books. And and I know, Mark, when you, you probably feel this too, I feel that the stroke and now this cancer journey are almost gifts in ways because I, one, I, I met Mark. I get to meet so many beautiful people and yes. in this journey and my world is grown so wonderfully and not that I'd have a bad life as a support manager, but boy, I've like gone places. And so the challenges have been hard, but also aren't they lessons on how strong you are and how, how um, empowered you are. So um you know, take it away, Mark. No, I could keep going. So, yeah. So, as we were talking about before we we started recording, uh, I would love for you to share that story about the. Uh, uh, oh, hugging. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I, I'm I'm an I'm 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 a hugger. I hug anyone, anyone with an arm's reach. My husband calls me a mauler and all my doctors used to come with their hands stretched out, but now they come like this <laughs> with their arms because I'm a hugger. And um, so one time uh, I, I have a plethora of stories and that's what I talk about when I do presentations and whatever pops into my head at the time is the antidote of the day. So, um, one time when we were going out to dinner and we were meeting some friends and we were pulling into the restaurant and there was a one handicapped spot and there was no other parking spots available. 
And my husband rolled down the window because they were in the car with no placard. And he said, do you, ha do you have a placard you could post? You know, because we find a lot of times it, that a lot of people use handicap parking as 10 minute only parking. And um, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not its purpose. Well, anyway, so it turns out the man who was driving had MS and the woman was getting out of the car to help him. And she just had a stream of profanity screaming at my husband, like brutally so. And it was like an assault. And so uh, um, now we have to go into this awkward situation where we're going to the hostess to give our reservation names. And we're standing, you know, very close proximity to each other. And while Jim is giving our our name, I turned around because she was literally in my space and I hugged her and I whispered in her ear to tell her that I'm sorry that she was in so much pain and that it must be awful as a care provider to watch her husband struggle so. I so understood what she was going through because although I'm not a care provider, I see what my husband and the pain in his eyes when I'm struggling. So I just said that I wanted her to know that she was loved and she was loved from above and that things, things always have an opportunity to be better if we let them. I always tell my son the same thing, bad is going to happen, but we have to allow good to rise but we have to allow it. If we don't allow it, there is no good. And good can arise from even the bad. So she literally melted. And that was because I think she just needed acknowledgement and knowing that somebody cared about her. Anyway, I get kind of teary about it because I think about that. I think about the people out there that are lonely and and are going through pain on their own and don't have a support system. You know, do you know that um, loneliness is equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day? I, I just, that was a study on NPR and I was astounded, but it makes sense. That's how, how much it can, you know, not just the, so care providers sometimes feel loneliness, even though they're surrounded by people because they're in, they're lonely in their care providing. I, I, I just, I've seen it. And so um, I guess the thing I'd say to your audience, Mark, is just know that when someone's angry or bitchy to you, it's usually on them that something in their life is making them that way. Because people aren't like that by nature unless they're going through stuff and they can't, they have no one to share their pain with. When shared pain makes it lighter, it, it just does. Um, and that's why, like, I was so excited when I saw, uh, talking to Mark and like how he's overcome and what, I mean, he exudes kindness and um, kindness is, I, I have I, I have a bunch of sayings that I've written. Some of them are on my website, but like kindness is, well, like, uh, well, look, kindness is a language that the blind, can see and the deaf can hear. And that was by Mark Twain. But um, I like to say kindness uh, costs nothing, but it pays dividends. So um, that's my saying. And, and um, you know, just spread kindness because what it does, it, it boomerangs back to you. And that's the same with focusing on the positives versus the negatives. It's going to make the the positives grow, and that's that's my life. I mean, I I just as I was telling Mark that um, just be, before we went live about like my friend another friend says just look for the chaos and that's where Julia is and that's true. But um, it's usually fun chaos. It's like you know it's like I, I never have a I never been bored a minute. I've never had an opportunity to be bored. And as my mom likes to say, boredom is an insult to yourself. And I say, I like to follow that up with it's a lack of creativity. So there's no excuse for boredom. And I know as a kid, I used to say, I'm bored, I'm bored. But like now it's like, there, there's so much to do. There's so much in just 
life and nature and you know I'm could keep going and I'm gonna ask Mark to steer me <laughs> off the path. <laughs> 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 I just love sharing time with you. It's it's just such a great adventure. And, and I and I hope everybody sees what positive positivity can do for people. And, and Julia That's brought up a great for me is yeah, yeah. Julia brought up a great point. There's so many people right now that are depressed and lonely and don't have anybody to share things with and, and if we reach out and and help just one person a day and you know it doesn't matter where you are if you're at the bank if you're at the store you know just smile or open a door for somebody and, and that's what julia does and she has she walks with a cane and and, and a breeze. <laughs> That that and that is absolutely beautiful. So let, let's we're gonna wrap this up. But what are your final thoughts that you like would like to leave everybody? And how do we repair this earth and make this world a better place for all of us? Oh, um. Well, I think I mentioned in the last episode, it starts, it's not grandiose. We always like to think things have to be big and they don't have to be. They they should start with small gestures. Yes. I was telling Mark, I was at Trader Joe's getting carts and there we have a corral. So you have to walk through the corral and it is a kind of a pain. And I ended up giving three carts before I actually got one myself. <laughs> and it was like, would you like it? Yes, I would, you know? So, I mean, that's how simple it can be. Um, and how, it's not just um, how to make the world a better place, but how to make our lives a better place. It doesn't just happen. You have to work at it. I talk a lot about happiness and I, I say, you know, that's more of a cliche we really need to strive for contentment. How do you, how do you, you know, we'll have moments of joy, but how do you have contentment throughout your life? Well, it's all the habits that you create. And some of the habits might be that you, that you well-being habits, like keep a journal of gratitude. Now I'm not saying write a book, do three things every night before you go to bed that you're grateful for and then in the morning review them and maybe add three more of what you're going to do today to achieve more gratitude those are the things like they're all little things everyone thinks that happiness is like why are you so happy well it's not like it's not like it just landed it's like you have to for for positivity to you have to practice positivity it's it takes practice it's not uh, it takes work to be happy it's, and, and it's worth it because it's the quality of your life. And when you're happy and you're content, it exudes to others. And that's why I'm attracted to Mark. I'm drawn to him in the sense that it, and that's what happens in your life when you have that. You're drawn to other like-minded people. And that keeps fueling your world. And that's how you make a world a better place. Because the more that you work on your habitual um you know making things better in your own life it will make others better i i don't know if that makes sense does it oh work? completely it, it and it was really really well said thank you <laughs> thank you so much julia for your time and for sharing your incredible positive knowledge uh, i absolutely love it so Thank you so much. And in fact, uh, uh, we're going to have uh, Julia speak at our, our uh, Cancer Conquering community down the road. So you can look for that. But I just want to thank everyone for joining us here at To Be Your Own Hero. Julia already said it all about helping make the world a better place. So I'm not going to rehash that right now. But thank you so much. Please like, subscribe, make a comment in the comment section of the video. Thank you, Julia. It was awesome as as always. And I look forward to seeing all of you next week at 
to be your own hero. Thank you so much and have a beautiful, beautiful week. Thank you.